Hello, everybody. So my name is Cortland Brown, and I'm the Vice Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Carolinas in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'm also the AAEM Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Section Chair. And I'm so excited to give this lecture on ACLS. So first I wanna go into really quick why I love emergency medicine. So I actually had a really hard time deciding on emergency medicine and I dual applied into child psychiatry in emergency medicine. Um, and I am even on my worst days where we're having a ton of boarding, where we can't get patients admitted, where we you know, have a waiting room that's full of patients. I mean, let's face it, emergency medicine as a field does have some issues. But I am still, even on those shifts, so happy to be at work and so happy that I chose emergency medicine and I would choose it again within a heartbeat. And the reason really is because we are the only field where if you have a patient that's a CEO of the hospital in one room and then you have a patient that's unhoused without insurance in literally the next room over, we're able to provide them the same amount of care and attention and energy. If you think about it, every other field does at least at some point, if a patient has insurance, it'll determine the care that they're able to give them. Um, a lot of fields, if your patient doesn't have insurance, you can't even see them. Um, and if they you know, don't have insurance, if you are able to see them, you aren't able to offer them the same services. So you can't offer them the same surgeries, you can't offer them the same treatment options, but we literally can provide everybody the care that they need. And we also have a lot of support services, you know, social work, psychiatry in the ED. We have resources for patients with food insecurity. There's just so many resources. Um, and I just think that's absolutely incredibly cool. So we're gonna get into the objectives. So by the end of this lecture, I want you each to be able to give two examples of narrow, regular, narrow, irregular, wide regular and wide irregular tachyarrhythmias and one treatment option for each. And that probably sounds like some like random medical words right now, but I promise it will make sense very soon. I also want you to be able to describe the basic components of the ACLS cycle and four causes of bradycardia and one management for each. So how are we gonna accomplish all of that? So first we'll talk about tachyarrhythmias, we'll talk about those with a pulse, without a pulse, and then we'll go into bradycardia. So what comes to mind whenever you think of ACLS? So advanced cardiac life support. I basically think about, does a patient have a pulse or do they not have a pulse? If they have a pulse, then you just continue with your ACLS protocol if they have a pulse. And if they don't, then you start CPR. And it is almost that simple, but unfortunately there's a few nuances and those are the things that we'll talk about. And so first we're gonna talk about tachyarrhythmias and I'm gonna give you an approach to manage those. So we're going to break it down to what you should do if you're looking at an EKG or looking at a patient's monitor and they're in a tachyarrhythmia. And basically that means that they're just going fast, their heart rate is fast. So the first step should always be look at your QRS and determine if it's narrow or wide. So remember QRS is ventricular depolarization. In rhythms that originate from the atria, where they should, the QRS is generally narrow because the ventricles are being rapidly activated by the fast-paced atria. If the QRS is wide, which is generally greater than 120 milliseconds, that usually means that the rhythm is actually coming from the ventricles rather than the atria. So the ventricles aren't getting that fast kick activation from the atria that they're used to. There is one caveat to that, and that is something that's called aberrancy. And this word just confused me so much until somebody broke it down for me like this. So if there's a rhythm that's coming from the atria, so, you know, the chamber where it's supposed to, but there's aberrancy, then you will likely have a wide QRS. And aberrancy just means that there's a blockage somewhere. So even though the rhythm starts normal, it starts with that fast kick. If it's getting blocked or slowed somewhere along the pathway, then the ventricles, even though they're getting the signal from the right spot, aren't getting that fast signal. And so a few different things that can block it and cause aberrancy are right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block. And so that's really all aberrancy means. 
So now I'm going to show a video that talks a little bit about the different types of narrow complex tachycardia. And before showing that, we'll just go over them quickly. So sinus tachycardia or sinus flutter, it's just whenever it's going fast. AVNRT and AVRT, those are two words that always confuse me in the video. We'll touch on each of those. And then there's atrial fibrillation, which is your irregularly irregular rhythm and flutter with a variable block. So now I'm just gonna pull up the video. Let's talk about the types of SVT. And there are three main types of SVT depending on the source of the electrical signal. Atrioventricular nodal re-entrant tachycardia is when the re-entry point is back through the AV node. So the electricity passes from the atria through the AV node into the ventricles and then back through the AV node into the atria again. Atrioventricular re-entrant tachycardia is when the re-entry point is an accessory pathway. This refers to an additional electrical pathway somewhere between the atria and the ventricles that lets electricity back through. This is the most common type of SVT. Having an extra electrical pathway in the heart is called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This electrical pathway might not cause any symptoms, or it might cause episodes of SVT. The extra electrical pathway may be seen on a routine ECG as a slurred upstroke in the QRS complex, and this is called a delta wave. There will also be a short PR interval. This change on the ECG is caused by the electricity prematurely entering the ventricles through the accessory pathway. Finally, there's atrial tachycardia, and this is where the electrical signal originates in the atria somewhere other than the sinoatrial node. This is not caused by a signal re-entering from the ventricles, but instead from abnormally generated electrical activity in the atria. This atopic electrical activity causes an atrial rate above 100 beats per minute. Let's talk about the acute management of stable patients with supraventricular tachycardia. So those are really the main tachycardias that you need to think about, particularly whenever we're thinking about narrow complex, so narrow QRS. So now we're going to go into the treatment for each of those. Our first question is, does our patient have a pulse? Again, just going back to super basics of ACLS. So let's say they do have a pulse. So our first branch point is, are they stable or are they not stable? So let's say, what does that actually mean? So what constitutes being stable versus not stable? So unstable are those with signs of end organ dysfunction. And the ones that I generally think about are hypotension. Are they an acute coronary syndrome? Are they having that? Do they have altered mental status or AMS? Are they in shock? Do they have pulmonary edema or do they have acute heart failure? So if they're unstable, then you use electricity. Now that kind of takes us to the next question of what are the different types of electricity? So there's two main types. Defibrillation is the therapeutic use of electricity to depolarize the myocardium so coordinated contractions can occur. So the term defibrillation is usually applied to an attempt to terminate a non-perfusing rhythm. So these are your very, very bad things. And the way I think about that is for V-fib, ventricular fibrillation, which is a very concerning rhythm that we'll talk about in a little, we defib, so it rhymes. Everything else, so your rhythms that aren't as bad and aren't as concerning, then you can use cardioversion. And cardioversion is using electricity to terminate a rhythm that's still perfusing. So it could be anything that is still perfusing. Um, so by this definition, cardioversion is less urgent compared to defibrillation, although the patient requiring cardioversion may still be hypotensive or unstable, but they're not generally in cardiac arrest. Um, cardioversion is synchronized, which means that the electrical current is timed to the patient's intrinsic QRS complexes, and this minimizes inducing ventricular fibrillation. So now we've talked about our patient with a pulse who's unstable. But what about our patient with a pulse who is stable? So, and that's where the meds come in. So what meds do we use? And this really gets down to that previous slide that we had. And so it goes down into what rhythm do we have? So if we have a QRS complex tachycardia, 
these are our possible rhythms. Again, going through that algorithm. So the first thing that you should look at is, is your QRS narrow or is it wide? Now we're gonna talk about narrow complex QRS. The next step that you always wanna look at is, is your rhythm regular or is it irregular? So our regular rhythms are sinus tack, flutter and fib, AVNRT, and AVRT. And our irregular narrow complex rhythms are AFib and a flutter with variable block. So if we have sinus tack, you just fix the cause. If they're septic, you give fluids and antibiotics. If they're febrile, you can give an antipyretic. You wanna make sure that you don't slow them down too fast without fixing the underlying cause. Cause if they're in sinus tack, it's usually a compensatory mechanism. So usually their heart's going fast because it needs to to make up for something else. Then if they're in flutter or fib, you can do rate control and we do a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, or you can do rhythm control and you can use an antirhythmic there such as amiodarone. The next is SVT. So one thing that's always difficult is how do you differentiate sinus tack versus SVT? And it is really hard. So sinus tack has P waves that are upright in two and down in ABR, but SVT doesn't. But because your rhythm can be going so fast, it's really hard to see that at times. Um, SVT is in contrast to sinus tack, which is we mentioned usually a compensatory system. SVT is usually a problem with the electrical conduction system. And so what you can do that can be slightly diagnostic and help you determine if it's sinus tack or SVT is actually block that pathway. So the main medication that you can use to do that is adenosine. So if you can't tell what your rhythm is and it's going fast and it's regular, narrow, complex, you think it might be sinus tack or it might be SVT, you can give adenosine. And if it's adenosine, it will block that SVT pathway and your rate will slow down. If it's sinus tech, again, remember it's a compensatory mechanism. It's not an issue actually with the heart conduction system. And so it usually won't have any effect. Then we have our irregular narrow complex tachycardias. And so those are AFib and a flutter with a variable block. So basically think about your normal AFib, your normal a flutter, and then there's a block that's sometimes there, sometimes not there and it's not in any consistent pattern. And that's why they're irregular. But you still do the same treatment as you would as if they were regular. So you can do rate control with beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, or you can do rhythm control with an antiarrhythmic. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about our patient that has a pulse and has a wide complex tachycardia. So these are generally much more scary than your narrow complex tachycardia. Our wide complex tachycardia is using the same algorithm that we did before. So starting off looking at the QRS, determining it's wide, and then looking at the rhythm and seeing if it's regular or irregular, are VTAC, SVT with aberrancy, and torsades or VFib. But this can get even more simplified because regular wide complex tachycardia is VTAC until proven otherwise. And that's because VTAC is the thing that's going to kill you. And oftentimes, again, just like with SVT without aberrancy and AFib, these patients are going so fast that it's really hard to tell what they actually, what rhythm they're actually in. And so if you have a tachycardic patient with a wide QRS and regular rhythm, just assume that it's VTAC until proven otherwise. So the medication here that we use is an antiarrhythmic. And one that we can generally use is amiodarone or lidocaine. So what if you have wide complex QRS, but an irregular rhythm? So it could be V-fib or torsades. And so you ensure that your patient's stable and then consider adding magnesium for torsades. So putting this back into the ACLS algorithm, this is where we're at. So you have a wide QRS, which again is greater than 120 milliseconds, and you can consider adenosine, an antiarrhythmic, or expert consultation. So now I wanna go through a few patient presentations. So this first one, 
you have a 50-year-old female, no past medical history, coming in with palpitations. Their blood pressure is 120 over 60, and they're 100% on room air. They're alert and oriented to times three. So looking at the EKG, what do you guys think? Going through the algorithm, is it first we look at our QRS and we determine if it's narrow or wide? So this looks narrow to me. The QRS looks pretty narrow. Then we look and see if it's irregular or regular. And again, this is where it's going so fast that it's really hard to tell. It looks pretty regular to me. Um, and going back to that algorithm, if we have a regular narrow complex QRS tachycardia, you think about SVT, WPW, or AFib or flutter. And I don't really see P waves. So what's your guess that this could be? My guess is that it's probably, and again, you can't really tell, it's probably SVT because I don't see those P waves. And is our patient stable or unstable? To me, it seems like they're stable. And so what I would do is actually bagel maneuvers. And we haven't talked about those yet, but those are generally your first line for somebody that's relatively stable in SVT. And one vagal maneuver that I really, really love is called the modified Valsalva. And what you do is you'll have your patient sit up in bed. You'll take a 10 cc syringe and you'll instruct your patient that you want them to blow as hard as they can through the one end. And you'll have them blow as hard as they can for as long as they can. And then when you get the sense that they're tiring out, you will drop their head. So lay them completely flat. And if you're able to, actually make the bed so that it's Trendelenburg, so that their feet are higher than their head. So you'll lay them flat quickly. And while you're laying them flat quickly, you'll have somebody raise their legs up to 90 degrees. And then oftentimes that can break the SVT. If that doesn't work, then you can use adenosine. And so putting all of this in the algorithm that we had before, so you have a narrow complex, it looks regular. So these are our potential causes. We determined that it's most likely SVT because we don't see any P waves. And so you can use those vagal maneuvers or adenosine. What about now? So it's the same patient. We have a 50 year old female, no past medical history coming in with palpitations. Her blood pressure is now 70 over 50 and she's 100% on room air, but alert and oriented times two, and it's the same EKG. So still same EKG, so we know it's a narrow complex tachycardia that looks regular, but now our patient's a little bit different, so now she's unstable. So again, remember, if we have an unstable patient, then we use electricity. And so going into the types of electricity, if you remember that rhyme, so for V-fib, we D-fib. So this is not V-fib. So we most likely cardiovert. And this shows us where we are in the ACLS algorithm. So you have attack arrhythmia, causing hypotension, altered mental status, shock. So yes to that because our patient's unstable and we synchronize cardiovert. This is our next patient. So now we have a 60 year old male with past medical history of end stage renal disease on hemodialysis coming in with a fever and a cough. Their blood pressure is 90 over 60 and they're hundred percent on room air and they're alert and oriented times three. So let's take a look at the EKG. Is it narrow or wide? I would say that the QRS is narrow. And then our next step, is to look and see if the rhythm is regular or irregular. And to me, it looks regular. So now we know we're in this part of the pathway. Then we look and see, do we see P waves? And I do see P waves. Based on this, it looks like they're before every QRS. And so I would say that this is most likely sinus tack. And so going down, you wanna fix the cause. So they have a fever and a cough. They're most likely going to have an infectious cause. And so you can give fluids and antibiotics. Next, we're gonna talk about if our patient doesn't have a pulse. 
So, so far, all of our patients, even if they've been unstable, they've had a pulse. But what if they're not, what if they don't have a pulse? So that's simple also. You just start your ACLS algorithm for no pulse. So you'll start CPR. You'll give epi, bicarbon, calcium pretty much. So I always, one of the roles of med students during these cardiac resuscitations can be to jump in and do the compressions. And so it's helpful to have some songs in your head so that you can make sure that you're doing appropriate compressions, that you're doing them at the right speed. And so here are a few examples that you can do. So any of those songs that you want to have stuck in your head, um, just important, make sure you don't sing them out loud, but those will all give you the right speed for your chest compressions. So whenever you don't have a pulse after starting CPR, it's important to think about what rhythms could be going on that's causing the lack of perfusion. And important to think about, do you have a rhythm that's shockable or not shockable? So our shockable rhythms are VTAC and VFib. And our not shockable rhythms are PEA, which stands for pulseless electrical activity, and asystole. So let's go into PEA a little bit more. So my guess is on your rotation, you'll probably hear somebody mention or ask you about the H's and T's. So this is a way to remember the different causes of PEA, pulseless electrical activity. I generally don't really love this way to remember them just because I can't remember the H's and T's, but in case somebody asks you what they are, here they are. So the H's are hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion, which is, stands really for acidosis, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and the T's are toxins, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, thrombosis, a coronary thrombosis, so are they having a STEMI or OMI, thrombosis pulmonary, so are they having a PE and trauma. The way I really like to think about it is, is their QRS, again, going back to that wide or narrow? So pulseless electrical activity. That means that you see something on the patient's monitor, but when you feel for a pulse, you don't feel a pulse. So there is some cardiac rhythm, electricity, something is going on in the heart, but it's not actually perfusion. So going back to the QRS, if you have PEA and your QRS is wide, you should think about metabolic causes. So you wanna, generally those are hyperkalemia, acidosis, or sodium channel blockers. And the treatment for those are bicarbon calcium. So if you have PA, you have a wide QRS, think metabolic and give bicarb and calcium. It could also be ischemia or mechanical problems. So it's important to not forget about those. But if you have a narrow complex QRS and you're in PA, that's generally caused by mechanical things. So something that's blocking the pathway. And for those, the treatment is generally give IV fluids. And then there's specific causes that have specific treatments. So if it's a PE, like we have here, you give thrombolytics. If it's a tension pneumothorax, you can do a needle decompression. If it's pericardial tamponade, you can do a pericardiosynthesis. And if it's hypovolemia or hemorrhage, you give more fluids or blood. So to kind of break that down, starting out, if we have PEA, we look at our QRS complex. If it's wide, think of a metabolic cause and give bicarbon calcium. If it's narrow, think of a mechanical cause and give fluids. And then think further about the different causes of each of them and think about what you need to do to treat each of these. So now we're going back to our third patient. 
So you get an overhead dock to room three and you walk in and your patient just doesn't look like they're doing well. So just to remind us about them. So they're a 60 year old male. They have a past medical history of end stage renal disease on hemodialysis. They're coming in with a fever and cough. They got fluids, they were doing better. They were initially alert and oriented times three, but when you go into the room, they're unresponsive and there's no pulse. You look at the monitor and you see this. So the first thing that you do, they don't have a pulse. So you start CPR and you go see your ACLS algorithm without a pulse. But because they have this rhythm on the monitor, they technically have pulseless electrical activity. So going through that whole pathway, look at the QRS. Is it wide or narrow? In this case, the patient's EKG looks wide. So now we're going over here and we're thinking about our metabolic causes. We're going to start CPR, like we mentioned. We're going to do epi, just a standard part of our CPR. We're also gonna give sodium and bi sodium bicarb and calcium. So what do you guys think is actually the cause here? So my guess out of all of these here, hyperkalemia, acidosis, and sodium channel blocker is that the patient's most likely hyperkalemic because they are a dialysis patient. And so that's again why you're giving sodium bicarb and calcium. Next, we're gonna talk about bradycardia and we're just gonna go into the differentials. So I like to use a few different mnemonics. The first one that I'll talk about is PACE. So these are all things that can cause bradycardia. Propanolol, so any beta blocker or poppies. And I just think about poppies, think about your like Alice in Wonderland and so your opiates. Then anticholinesterase, clonidine or calcium channel blockers, ethanol, so alcohol, or digoxin. And another more simplified way to think about it is to not let your bradycardic patients die. So causes of bradycardia are drugs. We mentioned a bunch of them on the previous page, ischemia. So are they having a heart attack or electrolytes? Are their electrolytes off? So going back to our ACLS protocol for bradycardia, first you treat the treatment, you treat the symptoms. And if that doesn't work, then you can try atropine. And atropine is a drug that's very confusing, has multiple different mechanisms that I really don't understand. But the kind of most simplest way to think about it is that it increases the heart rate and improves AV to the conduction by blocking the parasympathetic influences on the heart. So if you have a bradycardic patient, first treat the underlying cause. So are they hypoxic? Do they need oxygen? Um, do they have an electrolyte issue? Do they need to fix their hyperkalemia? Is it a drug overdose, like a beta blocker? You can treat that with certain medications. And then if they're persistently bradycardic, causing any of these signs of poor perfusion, then you can try atropine. If that doesn't work, then you can try transcutaneously pacing them or starting them on one of these vasopressors. So going over just some of the main things, and these are really the slides that I would recommend taking a picture of on your phone as we're going through and just having them so that you can reference them whenever you're on your clerkships. So starting with tachycardia differential, talking about if it's narrow, so you have your QRS, take a look if it's narrow, then look at the rhythm, is it regular or irregular? These are the different causes, and then these are the different treatment options for them. Then going back to the slide, so now if we have our tachycardia and it's wide QRS, go into if it's regular or irregular rhythm. And if it's regular, remember that's VTAC until proven otherwise. If it's irregular, think about torsades and VFib. And for torsades, you can give magnesium. Then thinking about electricity, remember, cardioversion is generally for our slightly more stable patients. Defibrillation is for VFib. So for defib, for VFib, we defib. 
And you can also use it for VTAC. So this is when your patient is very, very sick. Now we have our causes of pulseless electrical activity. And again, remember to think about it, is your QRS wide or narrow? If it's wide, think metabolic and give sodium and bicarb and calcium. If it's mechanical, give fluids. And then our causes for bradycardia are paste. So for panelol or poppies, anticholinesterase, clonidine or calcium channel blockers, ethanol or DIG. And I'm just going to scroll through those slides once more just so that you have time to take pictures of them in case you want. So here's our narrow complex tachycardia. Here's our wide complex tachycardia. Here's our breakdown of the different types of electricity. Here's our algorithm for pulseless electrical activity. Here's our differential for bradycardia. And here are just some additional resources that will give you more information on this. And last, I just want to encourage everybody to join the AEM Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion section. It's free for student members, and there's instructions on this slide on how to join. We have so many great programs. We have scholarships for students. We have articles that we publish um, advocating for patients, advocating for increasing the diversity of emergency medicine residents, fellows, and attendings. Um, we have other podcast series. Um, we, just, we do so much, and it's a really great group to join. And so I definitely encourage everybody to join. And if you have any questions at all, here is my email. Sorry, it doesn't show it, but it is just my first name dot last name at atriumhealth.org. So Cortland.brown at atriumhealth.org. Thank you so much.